Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather with us tonight. Uh, on the 23rd of January, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. And of course, you can always do that with the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. And if you can't find what you're looking for, you have a question about what you do find, uh, feel free to email me anytime, david.snyder at noaa.gov. And I'd be happy to answer your questions as I am able. Now, as we go ahead in time here for our hazardous weather outlook, a couple things are going on. First, we're still dealing with snow and blowing snow potential out across some of the lower terrain in the western uh, Alaska regions. And we're talking about uh, the Yukon Delta, up into the Koyukuk, around Galena. Uh, most of these areas, and including St. Lawrence Island and the western end of the Seward Peninsula and around the Bering Strait, we're talking about snowfall, about two to four inches and on the high side, maybe about six. And we're still dealing with some winds that's creating blowing snow and reducing visibility there. But as an added bonus, a little sarcasm there, so pardon me, uh, <laughs> there is a little bit of sleet and freezing rain mixed in with there as well. As warmer air is moving northward, that's going to be a little bit more of a possibility for some of our western communities in the next several days as we're transitioning to that warmer weather pattern. So snow and blowing snow, poor visibility there, but also some light sleet and freezing rain. As you move a little bit further east, we're still dealing with wind across the Alaska range. Those south winds will gust around 50 to 60 miles per hour. That's going to continue as we head through tonight and early tomorrow morning. Same goes with the snow, uh, poor visibility, and freezing rain. A lot of this will start to improve as we get into the midnight hour, maybe as late as 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then we get into northern parts of southeast, where we do have some rain and snow falling across the northern Gulf. Periods of heavy rain and transitioning to a little bit more snow as you get up into the higher terrain here, and then rain for some of the lower terrain for southeast. But the orange is a watch. That's a winter storm watch that starts tomorrow night and goes into Friday. We're expecting along the highways above Haines and above Skagway, not at the sea level surface uh, city areas there. We're talking about above the cities. We're looking for about five to nine inches of snow. It is going to be heavy. It's probably going to be a, a good wet snow as well. Down below, we're expecting a, a decent opportunity for some heavy rain as well as the next weather system comes off the Gulf. What we'll see here in a minute is the building of a pretty decent area of low pressure and a very long fetch into uh, the mid-latitudes here that is going to bring up a lot of heat and a lot of moisture and is going to be aimed across the northern and eastern parts of the Gulf of Alaska. So a winter storm watch here for northern parts of southeast for the highways coming out of Haines and Skyway, not for the locations themselves. Wind advisories for the Alaska Range and then winter weather advisories for the lower Yukon Valley and the Koyukuk Valley and the Bering Strait communities there. Uh, generally two to four inches of snow, as much as six, poor visibility and blowing snow there. So up north, not a whole lot going on right now. It is cold, but temperatures are warming up. Uh, as we were looking at temps earlier today around the region, that high pressure system that's really locked in the cold is kind of transitioning eastward. Uh, the coldest spot I could find around 3 o'clock this afternoon was around Old Crow, north of Dawson there and right along the Alcan border. Uh, down to about 36 below, I believe. But didn't see any other stations across the North Slope that were nearly that cold. So here's the weather pattern and why we're not seeing that big cold across the North at this point now. We're back into a southerly flow. As you'll see in just a few minutes when we get into our aviation maps, the jet stream is cutting across the western sections of the Bering and the North Pacific and then dragging in a lot of warm and wet air coming out of uh, the mid-latitudes of the Pacific and moving all the way into the Gulf. That broad southerly flow is just screaming across southern parts of Alaska and that warmth and that moisture are all on the northward uh, bound journey now all the way toward the Arctic. As this continues, we've already seen a couple waves move through. That's kind of disrupting that colder flow, but it's taking some time to get that stuff out of the way. So what you'll see again in the uh, aviation charts in just a minute is we do have increasing areas of icing potential across Alaska, but a lot of that is still kind of high up right now because the air down below is still cold and dry, but the air up above 
it's moistening up. It's, it's getting wetter, it's getting warmer, and this is just one more wave that's going to do it. As this wave continues trekking northward, we're going to see a better chance for rain and warmth developing around south central. In fact, would you believe by Friday, the temperatures around the Anchorage area and the valleys, the western Kenai Peninsula could be in the upper 30s, not only above freezing, maybe in the lower 40s. If you're a fan of winter, you don't want to listen to anything more. Just mute me and I'll we'll wave my hands and it'll look great for a few more minutes. Across southeast, it uh, looks like periods of heavy rain may be possible again across the lower terrain. And for the higher terrain, that does mean a decent chance for some heavier snowfall as well. Now out west, what we're seeing is that snow and blowing snow right now and poor visibility because, because of it. But the sense that we've already got that transition taking place to a warmer atmosphere is that sleet and that freezing rain moving in. That's that warm air aloft sliding over the colder air at the surface. That tells us that uh, that transition is going to be fairly widespread for a large part of central and western Alaska and certainly uh, south coastal areas of Alaska. So here's the weather pattern right now. The big cold is still up north and again that's moderated con considerably since a couple days ago. Low pressure sitting off the Yukon Delta at 979 millibars and sure it's still snowing there and I haven't seen any widespread reports of sleet and freezing rain but I I'm sure there is some out there. As we look at Prince William Sound all the way toward northern parts of southeast, you can see rain and then higher terrain still looking at snow. And then we have several other waves of low pressure further to the south. As we get into tonight, uh, that is going to lift northward and reinforce that southerly flow into the northern Gulf Coast. Watch for rain to continue and pick up in places. Probably not a whole lot of precipitation around the Anchorage area or the valleys tonight, but as we go into your Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday for that matter, I think we'll start to see that pick up a little bit, especially on Friday as the next band moves northward. A look out to the west shows snow showers for many west coast communities and the Brooks Range. It's still going to be breezy, if not blustery, across some of your Alaska Range passes there. So if you've got to drive north or south, and especially if you're in a, a high-profile vehicle or any of our trucker friends out there, be extra careful. You might have to hold onto the, uh, the wheel just a little bit harder. Out across southwestern Alaska, periods of rain mixed with snow, and it sometimes in southwest it does look like we're going to see an opportunity for freezing rain here. I think you'll see that as we get into your uh, Thursday a little bit more. That threat will be a little more widespread across southwest uh, through the YK Delta there, maybe as far inland as McGrath, but most likely a little bit further south and west of that. That colder air continues to retreat to the north and to the west, and it looks like a broad area of at least light snow will be possible. And by that, I mean maybe a couple inches there as you head up into the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, Ambler, Bettles, and southward into uh, Galena. But just south of that, it looks like you'll quickly transition into the potential for some freezing rain. So keep watch on any weather alerts there. And again, if you start to see rain falling in there, temperatures at the surface, on the ground especially, are still at or below freezing. So any liquid falling on that is probably going to freeze on contact. And that just sets up a really dangerous and obviously slippery situation. Across southeast, periods of rain will be possible there for Thursday. You'll see the snow setting up. And as we get into Friday, it looks like a heavier surge of that moisture is going to move into southeast all the way around to Prince William Sound. So be prepared for a, kind of a rainy, soggy, but mild day and snow at higher trains. So if you're traveling up and down White Pass or Klondike Highway uh, and into Canada, you're going to run into some of that snow. You might want to adjust your travel plans or at least keep good watch on that. Across the west coast, it uh, looks like areas of light snow will continue. More showery as you get into Bristol Bay and south of the Kuskokwim Delta. And a look out west shows a 970 low working to the central and western chain there. Periods of rain and snow ahead of that and certainly another opportunity to reinforce that warmth for western and southern Alaska. In the meantime, it does look like we'll be developing developing strong storms for winds across a large part of the Gulf. Probably not hurricane force winds, but we are going to be seeing widespread storm force winds and probably on the stronger end of that line too for any mariners working through the Gulf. Let's take a look at temperatures quickly for your Thursday. 30s and 40s overnight in southeast. South central temperatures are coming up to at or above freezing for the valley all the way down the Kenai Peninsula down toward Kodiak. The interior still in the teens north of the Alaska Range, 13 below for Fort Yukon. Uh, the north slope temperature is still holding about 15 to 20 below. Constantly Sound in the teens, 20s for Norton Sound communities, including Nome, 7 around St. Lawrence Island and Gamble. 
20s to low 30s for south and west. Bristol Bay temperatures pushing close to freezing. Mid to upper 30s for the Alaska Peninsula and 20s and 30s out west. High temperatures tomorrow warming up quickly. 30s and 40s for many communities south and west. 32 in Nome, 6 below in Ukiavik, 22 in Eagle. Southeast back in the mid to upper 40s. 30s and 40s for Prince William Sound. A quick peek at overnight lows for Friday morning. Not a whole lot of change except we're still warming up. And as you get into Friday afternoon, you can see temps in south central in the lower 40s. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And on to flying weather now. IFR conditions should be fairly widespread across the central and eastern Gulf. IFR on the inside passages and at least the northern half of the outside waters there. As you get into the uh, Kenai Peninsula, especially around Resurrection Bay, northward into western parts of Prince William Sound, look for IFR there. The south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range into the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys through the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island, St. Matthew, all the way down through Etolan Strait and Nunavak Island and parts of the Kuskokwim Delta stopping short of making it into the rest of Bristol Bay. Uh, MVFR will be fairly widespread for just about all communities as we go through your Thursday. We will have a few exceptions around the Tanana Valley, but it really doesn't go a whole lot further than that. Uh, you'll notice IFR still hanging on across the inside passages there, all the way up toward Chilkoot and White Pass, across some parts of the south-facing slopes of the Eastern Brooks Range, and hanging out just shy of Utkiavik, but right over at Souk and Wainwright, and then southward toward Point Hope, Point Lay, the Bering Strait and still over the Kuskokwim Delta and some of the higher terrain there with MVFR again, just about everywhere else. A couple breaks in that pattern there for the central and eastern Aleutians, maybe the southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula, Cold Bay, False Pass. Uh, looks like you might catch a little bit of clearing there uh, for a time. Uh, IFR will linger across uh, southeast. That will pretty much be the rule for the rest of your Friday. As far as Prince William Sound goes, the eastern Kenai Pen and into the Copper River Valley, especially over the higher terrain and into the Tanita Pass region, as well as the Talkeetnas. Look for IFR there. And then pretty heavy across southwest through the Bering Strait and the northwest coast. Again, all the way up toward Utkiavik. The eastern central Beaufort Seacoast may linger at MBFR. That will change by Friday afternoon with MVFR uh, changing over to IFR conditions by the afternoon, especially for areas along the Yukon Valley, south of the Brooks Range, into the Yukon Delta, and into the Kuskokwim Delta region. Look for central and western parts of the chain to linger under IFR, and then the east and uh, northern parts of the Gulf Coast also looking at IFR with MVFR widespread just about everywhere else, including Kodiak Island. Here's your past conditions, and based on all of that, for Thursday, you will probably see some changes, maybe slight improvements for Attic and Activic and Attigan Pass, starting at IFR, leaning over toward MVFR as we go throughout your day. For the rest of the Alaska Range Passes, you're really not going to see a whole lot of changes throughout the day. We expect to see MVFR for Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, for Rainy Pass, Windy Pass, and for Isabel Pass. No change, really. Uh, marginal conditions there, all the way over toward Mentasta Pass. And as you move further south, remember we saw that uh, this kind of that IFR sneaking up the western side of Prince William Sound. It probably doesn't make it to Tanita Pass, but for Portage Pass, you'll at least start the morning there, and then maybe some improvement throughout the day. Uh, that may be back again on Friday, though. And for Chilkoot and White Pass, this looks like this is what we're going to see, really, for most of the day for your Thursday and also for Friday. Now, freezing levels indicates that warm and wet air is moving its way into the central and eastern Gulf. The gradient's pretty tight. You've got your surface freezing line and just south of that, your 2,000-foot line. Over southeastern Alaska, you can see an even tighter gradient. A 2,000-foot line comes in right through the misty fjords and then just south of that, your four, six, and 8,000-foot levels. Uh, the 2,000-foot line's right over Kodiak Island. And the surface freezing line then jogs way out to the west over the central and southern Bering Sea. As far as icing potential goes, though, the further north you go, we're still running into a lot of lower-level dry air. Even as that air mass is warming up for everybody, uh, the moisture that we need to get the ice going is above four to about 7,000 feet in the north, and about five to 6,000 feet in the west, and over southeast, above 9,000 feet. So it's still pretty high up there as things are warming up. Again, that moisture is building northward, but it's not at the surface or low levels just yet. Uh, here's the jet stream, and you can see that fast-moving river of air is just putting on the speed there, 100 to 155 knots, 160 knots across the northern Gulf as that ridge of high pressure builds across the west coast. Again, all of this helping to push warmer and warmer air in more northern parts of Alaska. 9,000 feet, the pattern really is the same. A ridge of high pressure again driving in winds at 60 to 80 knots over the open waters, slowing down to about 30 to 50 across southern parts of Alaska, 15 to 20 across the north. 
and uh, onshore winds for southeast about 30 to 35 with an offshore flow for most of western Alaska north of Bristol Bay with westerlies over the Aleutians. You can see some of those are coming in at 3,000 feet from 40 to about 50 knots. Strong southerlies over the Gulf again in Kodiak Island around 80 knots. Here's our ridge still in the same old place and southerlies over the north slope about 10 to 25 knots there, uh, more of an offshore flow over Kotzebue Sound. So turbulence, we do expect some speed and shear issues tomorrow. Over Bristol Bay would be the target spot there for isolated severe, generally below 4,000 feet. And really most of southwestern Alaska will have a decent opportunity to have considerable moderate throughout the day. That extends into the Kenai Peninsula and Prince William Sound, just about to Yakutat, and along the outer coast of southeast with at least some isolated moderate up in the northwest. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake off the Pacific coast of Japan generated a tsunami. This series of ocean waves sped towards the island nation with waves reaching 24 feet high. The result was devastation and utter destruction. Towns were engulfed by water and swept away. Farmland was flooded. Tens of thousands of lives were lost. The National Police Agency reported damages to hundreds of roads, bridges, and more than 100,000 buildings. The surging water flooded rivers and destroyed harbors. In some areas along the coast, Tsunami waves reached six miles inland. Tsunamis not only cause severe damage when they first strike land, but also as the water recedes back to sea. Tsunamis can inflict this type of damage because of some unique features. As tsunami waves travel across ocean basins, they may be as little as a few centimeters high, but they extend down to the ocean floor. This is different than traditional waves, which are only surface features. Tsunamis can also travel hundreds of miles per hour in the open ocean. As these waves approach a coast, the shallowing ocean floor slows the waves down and pushes the water mass upwards. The quicker the ocean floor transitions from deep to shallow, the greater potential for a higher wave height. So, tsunamis that experience this sudden shift into shallow water can have the height and momentum to pack a serious punch. Unfortunately, Japan found itself in this scenario. This image shows how abruptly the Japanese islands rise out of the ocean. Other coastal areas in the region have much more gradual slopes. The earthquake on March 11th was the most powerful known to hit Japan, and the tsunami it created had the necessary ingredients to make it such a deadly and destructive force. Eighty miles east of Japan, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake rocks the ocean floor. This disturbance causes a transfer of energy from the seafloor to the ocean, generating a series of ocean waves known as a tsunami. In about 20 minutes, waves strike the Japanese coastline. Other nations go on high alert because the tsunami will propagate or spread throughout the Pacific Ocean. As the tsunami radiates outward from Japan, it encounters a variety of ocean features, such as ridges and underwater volcanoes, which guide the tsunami and create a complex pattern of scattering and reflective waves. In eight hours, the waves reach the Hawaiian Islands, and in nine and a half hours, they hit the west coast of the United States. In 16 hours, the tsunami reaches the Indian Ocean and New Zealand. And by 22 hours, the entire Pacific Ocean had been affected. The impact of a tsunami can be highly variable because of the complicated interactions with ocean features and coastline elements. Wave height and speed will differ from place to place. Since tsunamis can be hundreds of miles long and travel thousands of miles away from where they originated, 
they are considered a worldwide threat when they form. These are the sounds of a tsunami warning. They alert residents that a killer wave is about to strike. These sirens, however, are just a small part of the sophisticated warning systems that played a role in Japan and in the U.S. during the Pacific Ocean tsunami in March 2011. Most tsunamis are generated by an undersea earthquake. Fortunately, Japan has one of the most advanced earthquake early warning systems in the world. It detects tremors, calculates the epicenter, and sends out warnings from over a thousand seismographs scattered throughout the country. The Japan Meteorological Agency issues the warnings and sends alerts to television and radio channels, the internet, and mobile phone networks. When the earthquake struck 80 miles offshore, warnings were generated in about three seconds. The tsunami warnings came three minutes later. These take longer because more complex calculations are involved and must factor in ocean data. Since the first tsunami wave struck the coastline within 20 minutes, the advanced warning provided some residents with crucial minutes to reach a safe area. While the earthquake sent powerful tsunami waves westward toward Japan, the tsunami also propagated east into the Pacific Ocean. Here, warnings are issued by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, operated by NOAA in Hawaii. NOAA maintains a large network of buoys with ocean floor sensors that are strategically positioned in the earthquake-prone zones of the Pacific. This system collects vital ocean data for tsunami forecasting. On March 11th, only 25 minutes after the earthquake struck, the first buoy station measured the tsunami and relayed information to Hawaii. Scientists use this data to run models and issue forecasts and warnings to nations throughout the Pacific. From there, local emergency managers decided what actions were appropriate to take for public safety. The earthquake and resulting tsunami devastated the Japanese coastline, causing damage that will take years to repair. While we can't prevent these forces of nature from happening, our early warning systems can help us prepare for the dangers headed our way. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And moving on to your sea ice edge now, you'll notice ice is still moving from east to west, pulling away a little bit from the coast here. We've got a long area of marginal ice developing through uh, Etol and straight down to the Kuskokwim Delta and north of the Yukon Delta and just outside of Norton Sound, all due to that easterly flow. Ice is still growing a little bit, but it's going to be slowed down considerably thanks to the warmth pouring northward here. So we're seeing a little bit of a reduction in movement in the ice around Bristol Bay. And the ice inside of Cook Inlet will likely go uh, undergo some some substantial changes as temperatures warm into the 40s for many locations around Cook Inlet as we head toward Friday. Uh, the latest update and outlook anytime at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. For southeast, look for winds to come up sharply from the southeast as we go into Thursday afternoon. Gusts to 35 knots around Stevens Passage. Southerly is coming into the Lynn Canal at 20 knots with 4-foot seas, 7-foot seas in the Clarence Strait. And 35 to 40 knot winds across the outer coast. Look for seas to climb from 17 to 18 feet as we get into Thursday and even more so on Friday with seas up to 21 feet outside of Icy Cape and Cape Fairweather. Uh, 15 feet outside of the Dixon entrance and outside of Sitka, 35 knots from the south will give us 16 footers. As we get into the inside passage, you're looking at 15 to 25 knot winds from the south and southeast. Seas generally growing from 3 feet to 7 feet in the south. As we get into Thursday across south central, look for a northeasterly flow, 30 to 40 knots coming down Cook Inlet. Uh, easterly is off of Kashimak Bay with a 12 foot sea there, 16 foot seas in the eastern barrens. And south and southeasterly is 40 to 45, will continue to grow. 17 to 18 foot seas there inside of Prince William Sound, 40 knots from the east with a 10 foot sea as we look at Friday. Remember, we were talking about strong storms, and here they are. Uh, south and westerly flow, 50 to 60 knots. These are sustained winds now. 
Looking at 22 to 28 foot seas there in the northern Gulf for Friday inside of Prince William Sound. 60 knot winds, storm force there, 15 foot seas expected inside of Prince William Sound. Not a good day to be out. With westerlies crossing Cook Inlet, 45 knots, 13 foot seas there across uh, areas north of Kashemak Bay to Clam Gulch all the way up to Kenai and southeasterlies over the ice as that melts. 30 knots there across northern parts of Cook Inlet. For Prince William Sound, I'm sorry, uh, Bristol Bay, easterlies at 25 with three foot seas over the ice and uh, ice free waters. A southwesterly flow down the uh, Bering Strait coast, 30 knots with a six foot sea. South and westerlies coming into Kodiak Island, 40 to 45. Seas climb from 16 to 20 feet there on Thursday. And as we get into Friday, winds come down, but seas stay up anywhere from 15 to 20 foot seas around Kodiak Island. Westerlies over Shelikoff Strait with an eight foot sea. And west and southwesterlies, nine to 11 foot seas across the Bering, 25 to 30 knots there over the Bering Sea coast. For Thursday in the chain, uh, remarkably calmer conditions here as we look at 25 to 30 knots for most areas. You're looking at seas anywhere from about 6 to 12 foot seas for the central and eastern chain and 12 to 15 feet for the Pacific coast there. As you look out west, more of a west and southerly flow at about 30 knots. Seas as high as 18 feet between Kiska and Adak. And you'll start to get a little bit more of that wraparound flow as low pressure reorganizes in the west. We'll still have a deep southerly flow across the eastern chain, but remember we've got a low pressure system building here in the west, so we'll expect to see a little bit more of a southerly surge developing for the central and eastern chain as we get into Saturday and Sunday, and that means more warmth spreading into the Bering Sea there. But in the meantime, Friday, 30 to 40 knots, most areas looking at about 11 to 17 foot seas for your Friday. For the west coast on Thursday, north and easterlies over the ice. Remember, a lot of this is still pushing some of that ice away from the coast, so watch for more marginal ice to grow. 20 knots over St. Paul and St. George as folks are heading out there and north toward the St. Matthew Island waters there just south of the ice edge. 8 to 9 foot seas there for Thursday. For Friday, not a big change, a little bit more of a southwesterly flow develops as we're talking about. 25 to 30 knots with 9 to 11 foot seas in the open waters. For the north slope, north and easterly winds over the Beaufort, 15 to 25. Northeasterlies coming down through the Chukchi coast, 25 to 30, all over the ice there and into the Bering Strait. Not a big change for Friday, still looking at about 25 to 30 knot winds and generally from the north and from the east. Recapping tonight's weather, it's all about the warm air spilling into the region. As that builds northward, we'll continue to see winter weather advisories for our friends across the Yukon Delta and into the Koyukuk Valley around Galena. Watch for areas of rain and freezing rain and probably sleet there as we transition to a warmer weather pattern. Two to four inches of snow tonight though, and uh, that could extend to as much as six inches as you head into the Bering Strait communities around St. Lawrence Island. Watch for warm weather to build northward and periods of rain will continue to pick up across the Gulf Coast. Some of that could be heavy at times, especially around southeastern Alaska. For higher terrain above Haines and Skagway, a winter storm watch is posted for five to nine inches of snow that could begin tomorrow night and into Friday. Uh, for South Central, rain will develop with temperatures back into the 40s and periods of snow showers will continue in the north with blustery conditions in the mountains. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.